the tank crew splatter mask of the Great War. Yes, not only is it an iconic piece of kit within the artillery special of the French army, but it was also iconic in regards to all of the tank users of the Great War, as all of the tank users would be issued one of these eventually. And yeah, this mask just perfectly encapsulates historical themes of the Great War with ideas such as the old world clashing with the new world. And really, I would have to agree. You have here an armored faceplate with vision slits utilizing chainmail in a very medieval style being used on the modern battlefield in none other than tanks. Chainmail being used inside tanks. That was the Great War. So as you can see here, I did write quite a bit of notes for this one. But before we get into the history of the tank splatter mask, let's first talk about spalling and why the splatter mask was considered to be an answer to the problem of spalling in tanks. So when bullets and other high velocity projectiles impact the tank's armor from the outside, the shock from these objects would sometimes cause armor to spall from the inside. And uh, there were many factors to consider on why spalling occurs, such as the type of projectile, as well as the tank's armor quality and its armor integrity. So uh, anyways, the spalling itself is the flakes of armor and other debris that fly off inside the tank from the impact. And depending on the size, the spall could cause irritation, wounds, or even death to the tank crew. Of course, being the first users of the tank in combat, it was naturally the British that would first run into this problem. Thus, the British would first produce the tank's spire mask to protect from light and medium spalling as well as burns. So how did a British design end up in French hands? Well, none other than the Americans. The mask would be first introduced to the French through the Americans, specifically an American officer attaché training with the Atelier Special in April 1918. The French tank crews would experiment with these masks with the Americans, however, the Americans did not want to give any of their spy masks away to the French officers to give to General Estienne, head of the Artillerie Speciale. So, on May 1st, 1918, Lieutenant Colonel Vall, commanding the Artillerie Speciale of the 1st Army, would inform General Estienne of these splatter masks and that the Yanks received them from their training in the British Tank Corps. General Stian was greatly impressed by these spire masks, so much so that he would order Minister of Armaments Louis Le Cher on May 3, 1918 to allocate 2,000 copies of these masks. On May 11, 1918, tests were carried out during tank maneuvers and it was agreed upon that the tankist would greatly benefit from such a mask. Now these tank maneuvers would show that the weight and visual discomfort of these masks were not considered to be significant issues and would be remedied by further training with the mask and by improvements and upgrades to the mask in the future. An official order was placed on the 17th of May, and Britain would begin to supply France with 600 masks in total each week beginning June 28, 1918. Now, at the time, there existed several different experimental designs for this mask, but Lieutenant Colonel Vall would ensure that only one specific mask would be chosen for use in the Atelier Special, which I will describe later. Per the allocation order to the British, 2,000 masks would be received by the Tankists in August 1918, and the first French users of the tank splatter mask in combat was none other than the 501st. Now the tank crews of the 501st, when wearing the tank splatter mask, would note poor visibility and a greater negative sense of being claustrophobic and isolated from their fellow crewmates when in the tank. However, despite this, the mask did prove effective in stopping light to medium spalling and burns per its design requirements. Now the 2000 ordered masks would be distributed throughout the Atelier Special, and you can see photos of various French tank crews wearing them. And if you took note of the historical dates, you can see from how fast the splatter mask was accepted into French service that spalling was considered a very serious issue. And if you take note of the French official combat history books of the Atelier Special during the Great War, you would note that there was a lot of head injuries and a lot of accounts of enemies shooting at the tank vision slits on purpose, obviously intending to wound the crew with the spall. So of course, General Stian and the officers of the Artillery Special would take every action needed to protect the crews when inside the tank. 
and that's really why the allocation and distribution of these masks to the tank crews of the Atelier Special can be measured in months. Is that there was a need for these, and they needed them now. And these masks did do their job, and they actually were effective, which is why every user of the tank during the Great War would issue one version or another of these tank splatter masks to their crews. Again, a very old world solution to a new world problem. And now for the detailed look of the tank splatter mask. So we see here the steel faceplate, which is covered in sheepskin leather with the two millimeter wide slit cutouts at the eyes, which is of course smaller than the five millimeter wide vision slits seen on the tanks themselves. For a look at the back of the mask, we can see here that it is eh, slightly padded and covered with chamois leather, which was usually in white. And the method used to secure the mask to the face is this long, single strip of fabric on each side, which is looped around this hinged eyelet that is mounted onto the faceplate, as you can see here. And this long, single strip of fabric as you can see this, the pattern of the fabric, it would be sewn on the middle of itself right here to prevent it from slipping off of the eyelet. And that would fix the fabric strap to the faceplate. As you can see here, the ends of the fabric strap were folded onto themselves and sewn on to secure. Here we have the other side using the same exact method, that is, sewn on the middle to secure it onto the eyelet, and then fold it on itself at the rear, and then sewn on to secure it. And of course, you have the very cool chain mail that makes up the lower half of the mask. And you can see here, the chain mail was mounted through the use of these larger loops that were each mounted onto the faceplate itself by more eyelets. Let's get a closer look here and see what I'm talking about. So here we have the faceplate mounting, which is fixed to the round larger loops, which is then fixed onto the chainmail itself. And this was done to provide a degree of movement for the lower chainmail you can see here, right there, there's some alternate views of the chain mail. It is quite rusty on mine, but you can see the links are alternating links. Now the chain mail does extend a little bit into the cheeks, and this is supported by these round loops, which fix onto the same hinged eyelet that the straps mount onto. So you can see here the loops and the methods used to fix it onto the mask. So once again, here is the methods used to fix the lower half of the mask to the faceplate. And here is how they fixed the two different pieces of leather together onto the armored faceplate. We can see that they did indeed just use threading to essentially seal the two pieces of leather together onto the mask itself. There is again the back of the mask. Here is the front of the mask. And then you have the mounting of the strap and the mountings of the upper faceplate to the chainmail and this side same exact thing the strap mounting and then chainmail to the faceplate and that really constituted the tank splatter mask again a very iconic design of the great war so when a splatter mask was issued to a tank crewman for the first time it would feature a paper tag, which was mounted onto the hinging eyelet via twine. 
and this tag, written in English, would instruct the wearer to conform the mask to the shape of their head for proper fitting. So what the tag is trying to say is essentially conform the mask to the shape of your face before you wear it for proper fitting. And yes, the moment you've all been waiting for, I will now do a historical demonstration of the tank splatter mask in use within the Artillery Special. So, let's start off with me first receiving the mask. So it's going to show up in its default form with a tag telling me to conform the faceplate to the shape of my head. So I would do that, conform it to the shape of my head, I would then cut off the tag and do away with it, get rid of the twine as well, and I would be left with this. And this mask already fits my head, but yeah. When not in combat, the tank crews would choose to wear the mask in what was called the alert position. And the alert position is where you take the mask and essentially wrap it around your neck, which I will show now. So around the neck as such. So as you can see, this is the alert position with the straps around my neck and the splatter mask up at the front here. And as the name suggests, the alert position would be used by the tank crews when operating inside the tank, not in combat. Now let's say that the tank crews are being engaged by the enemy or they are attacking. Well then the alert position would be removed and they would of course wear it over their head which I will demonstrate now. So you take off your helmet, like such. Remove the alert position. The strap closest to you goes around the side of your head, like such. And then the strap that was farther away from you goes over your head like such. And this will give the mask the proper support it needs to stay on your face. Next is the helmet, it goes back on your head. And then again, tighten your chin strap of the helmet so that your helmet doesn't wobble or anything. And of course, you can't forget your burn resistant gloves when operating your cannon or machine gun. And now you have a battle ready tank crewman. So to reiterate, when going into an attack, you take off your splatter mask, remove your helmet, put the splatter mask on your head, put one strap around the side of your head, one strap over your head, take your helmet, put your helmet back on, uh, tighten up the chin strap, and everything will be secure. And you will have a very nice fitting on your tank splatter mask. So you're probably wondering how's the visibility, and I would say it's kind of like party glasses. It's really not that bad, um, though I would imagine when in the battle, in combat, uh, working with your crewmates, it would cause some issues. And I do agree that it would, in some sense, cause a sense of isolation from your crewmates. Uh, though I, I don't know, it's. I would have to pair it with the 5mm wide vision slits of a French tank of the Great War. Would I rather have spalling directly into my face or, you know, at least something to protect me? And I, I think I would opt for wearing one of these in a Great War vehicle. Historically, it did actually come down to personal choice. As a tank crew member, would you rather risk the spalling for enhanced visibility? or wear the mask and have reduced visibility but be protected from light to medium spalling as well as burns. And thus, it was left for the individual crewmen to decide. And well, for me, 
I think I would have chose to wear one of these splatter masks when in combat in my tank. So the question remains, why haven't we seen another splatter mask like this after the Great War? Well, several reasons, including improvements to armor quality and design, such as spy liners and the reduced usage of rivets, as well as the usage of bullet-resistant glass in place of direct vision, and as well as the usage of periscopes. And of course, these all factor in to reduce spalling and reduced injury to the crew from spalling. Note that the vision slits of Great War tanks were direct vision with no bullet-resistant glass, which of course would run the risk of direct spalling into the face and eyes of the crews. So, in conclusion, the iconic tank splatter mask of the Great War, the old world solution to the new world problem of spalling inside tanks. And it did do its job effectively, however, became obsolete due to improvements in armored vehicle design. However, once again, it remains an iconic piece within the tankis of the Artillery Speciale, as well as all the other tank units that served during the Great War. So in terms of reproductions of the splatter mask and your tankist impression, there are people who do make reproduction tank splatter masks. They are out there. You do have to try and search individually as there is no main producer of the splatter masks. It's kind of sporadic. Now there are originals still out there for sale. However, they are expensive, so just take note of that. So for anyone looking to do a Great War French tank crewman impression, there are splatter masks out there, whether they are original or reproduction, and just choose wisely and choose what is best for you. So this has been a Tankist from the 501st, wishing you good luck on your impression and good fortune.